In this lesson, I want to cover the purpose of service level agreements. So when we think about those skills that are being assessed, we're now diving into this last little group and we're looking at, well, describe Azure service level agreements and service life cycles. And so in this lesson, we're gonna look at the first two, well, what is the purpose of an SLA and how that can be impacted. In the last lesson, we'll look at that service life cycle. So we're gonna finish off those last few components. Now, if I think about the cloud, many elements of the service are the responsibility of the cloud provider. I don't have control over the physical fabric or the hypervisor, and depending if it's PaaS, operating system and many other aspects. So as a customer, I want to understand what I can expect. What is the commitment from that cloud provider about the availability of the service that I'm paying money for? And so service level agreements provide exactly that. Now the whole point of a service level agreement is often you'll hear about a certain number of nines. This is all about the availability of that service. For example, if I see two nines, that's 99% availability. So if I was thinking per week, i.e. how much it can be down, well, a two nines means each week it can be down for 1.68 hours, or quite a lot of time. But if we then start going to three nines, so 99.9% .9 SLA, well then that goes down to 10.1 minutes. If you then start expanding that out to 99.95, which is actually a fairly common number, now you're down to five minutes of downtime. If we can get to four nines, well it gets even better, now we're down to basically 1.01 minute of downtime. And if you could, if you had like five nines, well now you're down to six seconds of downtime a week. And obviously you can extrapolate that out to monthly, annually, etc. And so Microsoft has SLAs for its various services. And these are all called out in an SLA document. So if we go and look, Right now, firstly, we'll start off the service level agreement page. And it breaks it down by all the different types of services. So I might say, hey, compute. And an obvious one is virtual machines. So I can go ahead and look at the SLA for virtual machines. And at the top, it gives kind of this summary idea. And what we can see here is, well, we see this first number. And we see 99.99%. Fantastic, so four nines. But what's super important about that value is it stresses the point you have two or more instances deployed across two or more availability zones in the same Azure region. So the point here is you can get a four nines SLA, but to get that four nines SLA, remember we think about the idea that Remember you have a region, and then within that region, it's made up of those different physical facilities that are exposed to each subscription, your C3, kind of that AZ1, 2, and 3. So what that SLA is saying, hey, if you want the four nines, well, I need to have basically at least two VMs that are part of that service. So they'd probably be behind a standard load balancer that was zone redundant to make the load balancer resilient against the zone failure as well. And then that combination, those together, and it's minimum. I probably also have one over here as well. This gets me the 99.99 SLA for the compute. So availability zones impact the SLA because basically you're saying, hey, uh, I'm spreading my service over multiple AZs, so as Microsoft, they can feel more secure offering a better SLA, because they know, hey, we have independent power calling networking to each of those facilities, so even if one had a problem, chances are the other one is still up and running. So availability zones have a big impact on a lot of the types of SLAs. But if you go back to the document, what about if you're not? 
Well, then it talks about, okay, well, we also have this idea of 99.95%. And here what you have to do is have two or more instances deployed in the same availability set or the same dedicated host group. So what this is now doing is it's a lesser SLA because now the commitment is, well, remember, within those availability zones, there are racks of servers. So there's different racks of servers within here. And what an availability set does is an availability set distributes the workloads over multiple racks. And so now what we have is, well, we know we have a VM here and a VM here within that availability set. So that is not as good as an availability zone, which is a different physical building. Let's kind of write those out for your notes. But it's still pretty good. They have separate power supply units and network switching. So at this point, if I use an availability set, well, okay, 99.9. 5% SLA. So it goes down because I don't have as much isolation between them. But what about if I don't do that? So then you start getting into these ideas of single instance virtual machines. And then really the SLA depends on the type of disk you're using because depending on the type of disk, they have different resiliences on the storage fabric. So basically, if I'm using, in this case, premium or ultra for all OS, then you can get three nines. If I'm using standard SSD, well, I can get 99.5. If I'm using standard hard disk drive, it's 95%, which is kind of sad. Um, so if you get into the single instances, then that's where, okay, then it comes down to the type of disk I'm using, because at this point, I've just got a single kind of VM sitting here. And so it completely depends on what is that disk that's gonna drive the SLA for a single instance. That's why I'd pick a better disk. And this is just VMs we're looking at. But all of the services have their own SLAs. And you get more detail. If we keep going down, will we get an introduction to the point of SLAs? It gives you the idea that they are financially backed, so you're eligible for a credit towards a portion of the monthly service fees if the SLA is not met. It has general terms about what all the different things mean, how you make the various claims, what the service credits will be, any limitations around it, and then the SLA details itself. And hey, this is the service credit you get if the uptime is less than whatever these percentages are. And you can go through for every single type of service and go and see this. Now, how do you know if the service was impacted? So there is the Azure Status Board. So here I can go and see for all the different regions, all the different services and their current availability. And of course, as we saw previously, you can always go to your service health dashboard in your subscription to get more detail actually about it. So this is all great. This is all the idea that, hey, I have an SLA for a resource. Let's say this is 99.9. .9. But what about if I use two resources? I need both of them. Maybe this is a compute service and this is a storage account or something. You get the idea of a composite SLA. And the composite SLA is not 99.9 .9 because they're each 99.9. .9. Because think about logically, both of these have to be up and running for my overall service to work. So my actual composite SLA is going to be less. It's going to be kind of 0.999 times 0.999. So it's going to be a smaller number. So it's going to reduce. Now, alternatively, there's a chance that, well, maybe for this backend database, I have another type of service that can be used if this one wasn't available. So this now becomes kind of this or relationship. So this has to be there, but either one of these. So this will improve the SLA because now I'm looking at, well, 
What is the chance of it not being available? And then what's the probability of them both being unavailable at the same time? So this now becomes kind of this 0.001 times 0.001. So it starts to become this tiny, tiny minimal number, but then you still have to times it by the resiliency of the other service. And the Microsoft document goes through an example of this. So if we go and jump over to the architecture center, we can see the idea of understanding service level agreements and composite SLAs. So their example here is talking about a web app talking to a SQL database. So imagine it's just those top two. And it's saying that composite SLA would be exactly what we just talked about. In this case, 99.95 times 99.99, well, that's gonna be lower than either number. So it becomes 99.94. So I get a lower composite SLA than any of the individuals, which again, you would expect because there's a chance either one of them could be down. And if either one of them are down, my whole service is down. But then what they're adding in is this kind of resiliency for the SQL database via a queue. So now one of them is four nines, one of them is three nines. And exactly as I drew on the board, well now the composite SLA of that storage layer is the chance of them not being available at the same time, which is minuscule. It, it's almost, it's not gonna happen. So it's availability is this massive 99.99999, i.e. almost 100%. So with that in mind, the complete composite SLA is really just the SLA of the web app, which is at 99.95, and then basically 100%, which means the composite SLA ends up as basically being the same as that of the web app. So there are things you can do to improve your SLAs by architecture. We can generally get a better SLA if we can add in this or relationship, because now it's in our favor. What are the chances of both of them being hit at the same time? It, it's low. The more and relationships, the worse my composite SLA is gonna get. Now in reality, there's really this line that it's super difficult to get beyond four nines. Five nines is incredibly hard to achieve. You have to think about every service that is involved. Are you using Azure AD? Azure AD has a four nines SLA. It's very hard to have an alternative to Azure AD. So the reality is in the cloud, it's nearly impossible to get beyond four nines because many of the underlying services you're gonna rely on are four nines SLAs at best. So understand, hey, there's these different types of SLAs. Understand availability zones will generally improve my SLA because it's an all relationship. As long as I've got instances in multiple availability zones. And then my overall service SLA is, well, does it require them all to be there to run? In which case it's gonna decrease my overall composite SLA or are they alternatives to give me resiliency from one fouling, in which case it will improve my overall composite SLA. So that's the key and it's important to really understand those.